So um, if anybody here has ever traveled a far distance, east or west, you'll have come into uncomfortable uh, knowledge of your own uh, internal circadian rhythm being jet lag. So um, we have a internal biological clock that tells us when it's day and night. And um, when we travel over large distances, it clashes with the external uh, actual day and night. And so, uh, but as you know, if you've ever had jet lag, your body will recover after a few days as it receives the signal uh, from the outside world in the form of sunlight and starts to uh, reset that clock. So that internal uh, body clock is controlled by several genes, one of them very cleverly called clock. And, uh, period and cycle, and these are genes that were discovered by our next speaker, Michael Rosbash, who was working in fruit flies, Drosophila at the time, but as we already mentioned, um, biology and evolution and genetics is so intertwined that these are actually basically the same genes that we also find regulating our internal uh, body clock. And for this ex extraordinary work, uh, Michael Rosbash was awarded the Nobel Prize last year for his work on, so I think the phrase was, uh, discoveries of the molecular mechanisms controlling the circadian rhythm. And so I'm very much looking forward to hearing his talk now and to hear what other uh, light he can shed on our internal body clock. So thank you very much for coming. Thank you very much. So it's a, it's a pleasure to be here, and, and I think the best way to describe how thrilling uh, this has been is to say that when I received this invitation email and, and, uh, and read it during the day, I came home to dinner and my wife said to me, as she does every evening, uh, how was your day? Anything interesting happened? And I said the same to her, and, and I said, well, I got this invitation to this fantastic meeting. Uh, and, and I texted her last night and said, double wow, the meeting has been as good as advertised and better. So uh, thank you all, and I'll, I'll, try to, I'll, I'll try to entertain you for the next 30 minutes or so. Um, and in fact, let me get my clock going here. There we are. So uh, circadian rhythms, um, th these, the, the, the term comes from Latin, circadia, about a day. And that's because endogenous biological clocks, whether we're talking about fruit flies and humans, are not exactly 24 hours, they're about 24 hours. And it's really entrainment to the light-dark cycle, um, also temperature sometimes, which uh, keeps our, us bang on a 24-hour cycle. And, and the purpose of this, the major purpose of this, uh, the Red Queen story is not irrelevant, is uh, the early bird gets the worm, and the early worm avoids being eaten by the bird. So uh, this is really to know what's going to happen. And there's some evidence that this also governs what I call internal coherence, namely uh, what things happen uh, in what order, which is uh, often more efficient or more advantageous than having them all happen at the same time. And so um, it's really a long, long time ago that circadian rhythms arose uh, before uh, the atmosphere had anything like its current gaseous constitution and, of course, before nutrition uh, was anything like uh, what, it, what is available today. And uh, the, the oldest known clock um, is present in cyanobacteria. Um, I think I saw a picture of cyanobacteria from Adeline before. Um, this, these are photosynthetic bacteria, and they're responsible for oxygenation of the atmosphere. When these organisms were virtually the only uh, organisms on the planet, uh, there was a reducing atmosphere, and this is really, these organisms are responsible for giving rise to oxygen. And, and this uh, mention of cyanobacteria um, raises the point that Circadian rhythms have arisen multiple times in evolution, uh, as indicated by the fact that the clocks which keep time in bacteria and in plants and in animals are different. If you will, there's an analog clock in cyanobacteria and a digital clock in animals. That's, that's, that's simply a, a metaphor for how different the timekeeping machines are, not a, not a, a value judgment. 
Um, but these, because there's no connector between these different kingdoms, that is, the, the proteins and, and mechanisms are really entirely different, um, that they must have arisen multiple times, underscoring uh, how important this mechanism is for life. And <clears throat> having mentioned uh, evolution, I, I, I want to say a word about uh, physicists and, and biology, um, Schrodinger being perhaps a notable exception. I, I think evolution um, is, is, is a real stumbling block for people who have grown up in a, in a quantitative discipline or done math or physics because uh, life really is an unbelievably clunky Rube Goldberg device. And, and uh, when you look at some of these things and you, um, and, and you let, let's say, make some modest progress toward demystification, you think, my lord, who thought up that business? That is unbelievable. And I must say, sex being the great uh, example of such a thing. Um, and so, uh, it's, it's, it, it, it boggles the mind and it must be approached empirically. You can't think your way through this uh, ab initio. And, and I think that has created a real, a real stumbling block. And, and on that note, a segue, um, <clears throat> is, is this quote from Sidney Brenner. And we've, this, this, this general idea, especially the importance of new methods, new machines, new techniques, has, has come up previously. And, and I'm a... I'm a an advocate of this general principle, that is, science gets pushed forward for new, by new technical developments, uh, new discoveries, and new ideas, probably in that order. And I think what, um, what, what uh, many of these discoveries are accidental. Um, it, it, the the uh, transforming principle in 1928, really the, let's say, the true beginning of, of uh, genetics and DNA, was an accidental was an accidental discovery, um, and uh, often in the laboratory, the things that are most interesting and actually lead to real ideas that have some legs, although much less than 50 percent of the time, I would say, uh, come from some discovery which you then have to track down and think about how how how, how did that uh, how did that come about? Why is that band? Why is that strange band? Uh, on the gel. And ideas without experimental grounding, I think, are really overrated. And so, uh, on Sunday, um, I was visiting this museum in, in uh, I can never pronounce that word, um, Wrocław, approximately, um, the, the city in Poland, which used to be Breslau in Germany. And I took a picture of this picture of uh, Erwin Schrodinger, which is in this museum. And the reason I was visiting Breslau was because I'd never been to the city, and my father's last job, the last place he lived in Germany before emigrating to the United States, was in Breslau, and I was trying to trace down where he worked and the home and so forth and so on. And so, um, as, a, as a political commentary, and perhaps to, to bridge a bit to Schrodinger's move to Ireland, uh, something that um, I, I mentioned uh, this past December in Stockholm, um, it's notable that uh, four of the eight Americans who were there uh, were immigrants or first-generation Americans, and this was my dad's uh, visa. So, back to circadian rhythms, um, and, and speaking about discoveries, locomotor activity rhythms, the sleep-wake cycle, if you will, of a hamster shown here, um, on the top, a free-running rhythm uh, that is in constant darkness, which, as you see, drifts a bit every day, a little bit shorter, starts a little earlier, ends a little earlier because the endogenous rhythm of the animal is about 22 and a half hours. But if in a light dark cycle on the bottom graph, it's exactly 24 hours. And so the, I need to sort of emphasize here that this really is an incredible phenotype. It actually seduced me into the field um, because every animal is almost identical to every other one. And this is unprecedented in behavioral research. You don't have to study a population, which means you can really pick out a, a single animal. And this is analogous, of course, to location, 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 the real estate uh, mantra. And so we, we assay uh, fruit flies, their locomotor activity in, in a tube. The flies can run back and forth in the tube. And um, this was uh, our original monitoring machine 
from the 80s, ours being, uh, meaning Jeff Hall and myself, uh, with whom I collaborated and shared this prize. Uh, and, and Mike Young's lab used a very similar apparatus, and so there's an infrared light beam on one side of each tube and a photocell on the other side, and the flies can't see in the infrared, so they're in constant darkness, but you, you, it's a beam break device, and you can very easily measure their activity. And so this, this story really goes back to Kanopka and Benzer at Caltech. Seymour Benzer was one of, of these uh, uh, remarkable physicists who had uh, a, a love and a flair for biology, and he was an, an un, incredible empiricist. He loved making little devices to measure stuff. Um, and, and, uh, and Ron Kanopka, as a graduate student at Caltech, brought the circadian problem to Seymour. He'd been fascinated by this problem as an undergraduate, and he said, you know, we should really, we should really study this together in your lab. And so this, this, um, this makes uh, what's an obvious point to many of you, perhaps not, to the youngest in the audience, that, that using genetics is not here to describe uh, how different is my circadian rhythm from yours, and the answer is maybe a little bit, but not much. Uh, it is really to get, uh, as, as Ottoline emphasized, it's really to get an entree into the problem. What's the nature of the machine? And, and I, I, I want to just uh, mention that even something like Learning, uh, the ultimate in, uh, in, in nurture, relies on genes, which relies on proteins and so forth and so on. So there's no escape uh, from this. And so uh, my lab and Jeff's lab at Brandeis and Mike Young's lab at Rockefeller, the third winner this past December, uh, cloned and sequenced this gene. And, and we thought w this, would, uh, give us, uh, uh, this would give us clarity, and, and it didn't because it was early days of DNA sequencing, I should say, at least that was one reason. Uh, and, and so there were no relatives in the database. And, and it was um, a few years later that a wonderful postdoc of mine, Paul Harden, discovered that the messenger RNA that was encoded by the period gene underwent circadian oscillations. And, and the data indicated that the protein product um, was involved in a feedback loop which regulated its own transcription, its own gene expression, and, and we, we suggested at the time that that was, um, that was central to the timekeeping mechanism, and, and that's turned out to be uh, true. At least it's held up for the 20 years or so that this more expanded model has, has been in existence, and, and it also turned out that the genes and this mechanism that we were working on in fruit flies were gener was general. It was also true in mammals, in humans, in mice, et cetera. And three of the four proteins which are involved in this uh, small transcriptional feedback loop, small in, in, uh, in the sense of the number of components, key components that are needed to describe this feedback loop, are, are conserved between um, flies and mammals. So we were really beneficiaries of this conservation, which we uh, ourselves did not discover. And this emphasis of transcription here, um, which, which I do for the sake of simplicity and time um, and pedagogical uh, direction, is, is avoids or ignores critically important post-transcriptional regulation, which is also important for the timekeeping mechanism. And so, uh, in, in terms of the future, I, I want to touch on a few challenges. And the first one, is to emphasize that we really don't know why about 24 hours, what really accounts for the timing. And in biochemical terms, this would be posed perhaps as what are the rate limiting step or steps, probably multiple steps, uh, exactly what keeps time. And, and linked to this question is the second one, and, and that is how does temperature compensation work? So I left this uh, concept uh, out of the uh, introductory slide but the circadian period, the endogenous period of an animal, perhaps a mammalian tissue in culture to avoid homeothermic regulation, or a fruit fly, is essentially independent of temperature. So the Q10 is almost exactly 1.0. There's no change. This is virtually unprecedented in physiology. And, and this, mean, this makes sense. This makes teleological sense, or teleonomic sense, I, perhaps I should say, um, because uh, 
because if, if, you're, if you, you don't want your watch to go nuts when a, uh, a cold front sweeps into New England overnight and the temperature changes by 10 degrees centigrade. So the, the timekeeper should be temperature insensitive, but how that works is not known, and it's probably linked to the first question, that is the rate-limiting steps themselves are probably temperature uh, insensitive. So the, the, the second challenge is uh, levering, leveraging this knowledge about circadian rhythms to improve human health. And uh, as, as, a, as a backdrop for this challenge, uh, I, I need to sort of say in pictorial form here that the circadian clock affects virtual, virtually all aspects of animal uh, and human physiology. So everything that we do, um, it has a, has a circa 24-hour oscillating uh, component to it. And, and the question arises, of course, why is so much of physiology affected? And, and the answer lies in two very simple principles. One is that within individual cells, within uh, a, a, a mammalian fibroblast, for example, or a fruit fly neuron, this, this core transcriptional feedback loop regulates directly or somewhat indirectly hundreds or thousands of messenger RNAs. And, and this is through a temporal cascade of transcription factors, or at least that's the most likely explanation for most of them. This is analogous to the classical spatial regulation of, of uh, transcription and development. So there's uh, a, a lot of genes in each cell. And then, quite remarkably, um, in, <clears throat> in every tissue, in every cell, in every, almost every tissue, in mammals, for example, um, there, the clock, that same clock is operating. So the same clock is working in the liver, heart, spleen, kidney, lung, skin, as well as the brain. And, and the, the genes that are regulated in these different tissues are different in the different genes. And, and a consequence of this differential gene regulation, or I should say this overarching regulation, and then different uh, in different cells and tissues, is that the current estimate is that <clears throat> more than 70% of the genome of all mammalian genes are oscillating somewhere in some tissue or other. Generally, different genes in different tissues, but if you add them all up of the oscillating genes, you come to 70% or so of the 23,000 genes um, that, that exist in humans. And so I think that's a simple view, perhaps oversimplified, um, but useful on the way to a better description of truth, as we heard yesterday, uh, late afternoon. Um, and so let me touch on a couple of examples, which I think you'll, uh, I hope you'll find interesting. One is metabolic disease or diabetes. Uh, there's good evidence that shift work, circadian disruption enhances, uh, increases the frequency of, of this syndrome or disease. And I think the way to think about this, or a, a useful way to think about this, and to illustrate a, uh, a systems point, perhaps analogous to uh, one of the ones that uh, Ottoline mentioned, is, is to tell you that uh, food metabolites or food entrains peripheral clocks. So generally, the scheme of entrainment is that light goes in through the eyes, hits the brain, master pacemaker is reset, then a whole suite of hormones, let's say through the H HPA axis, then circulates and keeps all the peripheral clocks in sync. And generally, an animal eats under brain control. Um, but of course, if, you, if that gets disrupted, for example, in, in jet lag, um, then, then the there's, there's internal desynchrony because the peripheral clocks are out of sync with the brain. And it's because of the food metabolites in training peripheral clocks. And I think there's a, an interesting idea, far from proven, but a very interesting idea that uh, time-restricted feeding um, in sync with metabolic oscillations um, is, is a good thing. So to put this another way, the American habit of snacking or going to the fridge at 10.30 at night for an apple pie um, when you shouldn't be eating when your body says fast and, and repair systems 
or upregulated to take care of a problem is not a good idea. And so, uh, so I think this, the, the, the actual experiment that was done here is, is just simply described in the title. I don't have to read it. Um, but, you know, when you eat may be as important as what you eat, as, as, uh, as indicated. So sleep disorders, the second example. Um, and, and the point of departure here is that there are four human sleep syndromes, four, four sets of families, of which the simplest to describe is simply delayed phase sleep syndrome, staying up till, not being able to go to sleep, staying up till three in the morning, uh, and then sleeping a perfectly normal eight hours to 11. Nothing wrong with that individual, just phase shifted, but of course, if you have to get up for work or school, you have a problem. And so, uh, four syndrome, four families like that um, have been investigated where there's Mendelian inheritance of the characteristics, and all four families are due to underlying mutations or variants um, in, in four of these classic clock genes, uh, which are, as I said, are ortho, orthologous to uh, mammalian genes. And so I, I think uh, this problem will really, of sleep will really be well investigated in, in flies because of um, the fact that flies sleep, and they sleep in ways that is very similar to mammalian sleep. I, I woke up, speaking of sleep, you know, I woke up in the middle of the night uh, and, and realized, you know, this is sort of nuts, this PowerPoint business, because I, I said I shouldn't, I should change the title and say flies sleep is nearly identical to mammalian sleep rather than resembles. I said, who cares? And went back to sleep. <laughs> uh, so so um, if, you look at, if you look at a whole set of criteria that, that characterize sleep, um, all of them, except for a real EEG, uh, are recapitulated in fruit flies. And so, for example, there's very similar pharmacology. Um, modafinil is provigil stimulant. Um, there's, there, the effects of aging are almost identical in fruit flies um, as, as in humans. Uh, we, we, it, the, that 50-day-old fly has all the same syndromes that I do. Um, and, and, and most interestingly, from a scientific standpoint, I think, flies exhibit uh, robust homeostatic regulation. Namely, um, if, you, if you're sleep deprived, for instance, Monday through Friday, on Saturday and Sunday, you sleep longer. And in the ca case of humans, you sleep deeper in order to make up for the lost sleep. And that's, that's homeostatic. That's the homeostatic regulation, and fruit flies do that just like people, and old fruit flies do that less well than young fruit flies. And so this third challenge um, is really the question of why do we sleep? I think there's no really well agreed upon answer to this question. Uh, there's lots of uh, papers, data, hypotheses, but I think there's no consensus, and, and I think that um, this will require finding uh, the conserved function of sleep that applies equally well to Drosophila and mammals, by analogy, of course, to circadian rhythms. And the, the parallel question is who or what and where uh, is keeping track of sleep need? What, what really is tracking sleep homeostasis? What is increasing or decreasing uh, as a function of uh, not enough sleep? And, and how does that link into the question of the purpose of sleep. And so uh, I, I'll say a few words because we are the new kids on the block, namely Mike Young, Jeff Hall, and myself from this, this event, and it'll uh, give me an opportunity to s say a few things. Uh, and, and, and of course, uh, the, the point of this dessert, which was made by friends of mine, friends of ours, uh, a week after uh, a week after the phone call, and, and um, the, on the big piece of chocolate on the cake was written the words I used uh, at the press conference that morning because I said it's really a shame that the, you know the only three people can win the fruit f can win the Nobel Prize, but but uh, maybe they could make an exception for a non-human because 
really. The fruit fly is, is uh, the star of the show and should, share, should have shared this, uh, you know, this honor with us. And, and, of course, my title was The Future of uh, Circadian Research and Fruit Flies. And so let me say a few words about, about flies in, in, this, in this research context. So they're, they're being used to model and study many things. You're going to hear from Linda uh, Partridge about aging, although not exclusively about flies. And, of course, the reasons why this is being done are, are, are obvious uh, to most of you and to the people who are, for whom this not, not, are not quite so familiar. You can just read um, the sentence there at the bottom. And the reason they're being used to model all these different diseases is also very straightforward because organs and hormone systems, molecules, etc., neurotransmitters, they're... they're they're, they're conserved. Most of them are conserved between uh, flies and humans. And uh, uh, human disease-causing genes, 80% of these genes are, 80 of these genes are uh, present and perform the same function in flies um, as they do in, in humans. So really, the doing, doing this kind of modeling work um, makes a great deal of sense. Uh, Despite um, what I might call this translational perspective that is thinking about disease, human disease, it's really basic science which has been the, the, uh, the bedrock or the real contribution of, of uh, fruit flies. And uh, as uh, summarized here, this is the fifth basic science Nobel Prize uh, for the fruit fly 2017. Um, after these, these, this, this group of pioneers. And uh, um, the, the, uh, I think a frontier, a basic science frontier of the fruit fly, is really uh, due to the fact that Drosophila has about a million times fewer neurons in its brain, in its tiny brain, uh, than, than uh, humans. A and I was struck by uh, Saul's uh, five Nobel Prizes for 302 neurons, and I was trying to do the calculation of how many Nobel Prizes and Nobel Prize winners divided by 100,000, and should, should you get higher marks for a bigger ratio or a smaller ratio? Um, so the, the, uh, this, is, this is the size of a fruit fly brain uh, superimposed on a single rat cortical column. So, so we're really talking about a remarkably uh, smaller organ. And, and yet, despite this, the fly has this incredibly sophisticated behavioral repertoire uh, in which these very basic principles, which are, are uh, uh, central to our sense of being, learning and memory, aggression, motivation, mating and courtship, all of these different processes are, are being studied to great effect um, in, in fruit flies. And just to give you a snapshot of, uh, of circadian behavior and its relationship to the nervous, nervous system, this is a, a classic locomotor activity profile of fruit flies in a light-dark cycle under standard conditions, if you will. And, and the flies become active in the morning in anticipation of the discontinuous light-dark transition in the incubator. It knows that the lights are going to snap on and it ramps up activity in advance of that. There's a, a, a siesta in the middle of the day. There's an evening peak of activity again in anticipation of the lights snapping off and then, and then the animals uh, sl sleep at night. And, and this, this, this uh, periods of quiescence or sleep the middle of the day, for example, or why when, um, when you have a cocktail at two in the afternoon, if you're fortunate enough to be able to do that, you have no mosquito problem. But if you have a cocktail at seven at night, uh, at the peak of activity, you have a lot of mosquito problems. Same, same pattern for most insects. And so this activity pattern is directed, driven, controlled by only 75 pairs 
of central brain neurons. So the, in the fruit fly brain, of those 100,000 neurons, there are only 75 in which this molecular program is operating uh, in, in, the, in the red stain cells. And yet you can see from the dorsal projections stained in green there uh, with the surrogate to the neuropeptide which is expressed in those cells, that there, are elaborate, there is elaborate anatomy and processes despite the small size, um, despite the small size of the brain. So, so the idea is that this, this small brain will really facilitate exploring relationships. And I should just say from a, from a gene expression point of view, that when you look at the genes that are expressed in these different circadian neurons, they're very different, the different classes of neurons, remarkably different. And then when you look across time, when you look dynamically, at the gene expression, they're even more different. So, so you really need temporal information, dynamic information, if you will, in, in order to really define, even at the gene expression level, cell type. And so I think in about two to three years, thanks to, mostly thanks to Janelia Farm and the efforts there, we'll have a complete wiring diagram of all synaptic connections uh, in the central brain of the fly and all of the tools are available for doing all the kinds of sophisticated experiments um, that you've seen presented here from other animals, in particular, uh, <clears throat> in particular mammals. And so, a few words. Uh, I, I, this is my current lab, and, and of course, I, I need to thank for my, for my uh, uh, unbelievably fortunate career. I need to thank the people uh, who have worked, worked in my lab I want to say that um, in, in, these, uh, in this event in the past year, um, eight of the ten Nobel Prize science winners were, were uh, American guys, um, as I say, you know, senior, senior, uh, senior people. And, and the point of the age here, or I should say the first point, is that we really benefited from having grown up in an absolutely golden era in the United States, this post-war era, when, when research was, was generously supported and basic research was generously supported. And, and actually, I neglected to mention something very important from, that Campbell's talk reminded me of, speaking of basic research, that, that, that the Konopka paper I referred to before um, received eight citations in the first decade uh, after publication. So the, the, the point is um, um, this good thermodynamic principle that, that cream rises to the top, but the kinetics is, is, is uncertain. So, so one, should be, one, should be, one should be circumspect about, about uh, giving, giving, uh, uh, giving marks to, to contributions. And, and so this was a golden era, and the physicists even benefited more than we did from, from this, this uh, federal, uh, federal funding and federal patience. The, the guys who won the physics prize this past year was for observing uh, the gravitational waves that Einstein predicted 100 years previously, and, and they went 50 years working together without succeeding. And, and they were supported by the NSF for 50 years, uh, writing essentially the same renewal grant application every year. Um, and, and of course, patience was rewarded. And so, uh, as a final note, um, I say a word about um, the banquet and old, and old white guys. We, we got a, and biology and physicists, we, we got emails um, a month before, and they said, between the ceremony and the banquet, um, there'll be an opportunity to go to the toilet. <laughs> and, and, uh, and we thought, well, that's strange. And so, you know, we wrote immediately back, huh? How come? And they, and the, uh, very nice woman in charge said, well, at the head table uh, where you'll be sitting at the banquet, you're not allowed to get up until the king gets up. And, and the dinner lasts four and a half hours. Um, and so there, there was a, uh, and of course, hence the aging, hence the aging um, male and aging component uh, to, the, to the backdrop. And, and, and I, uh, we were all incredibly worried about this, and I asked, <laughs> I asked uh, the prince, the king's son, 
um, over cocktails beforehand, does, doesn't he have to get up in those four and a half hours? And like many 35-year-old children of distinguished uh, parents, uh, he, he, and he used uh, an epithet, which I won't repeat, but he, he just said, he's impossible. The guy has no basic needs. Um, <laughs> and so, and so the, 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 the key to this was, was uh, the biologist's emailing the physicists and saying, okay, I'm going to explain to you about diuretics. Who is going to put one in the king's drink? <laughs> um, <clears throat> and so, 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 so finally, as you said, as, as, as uh, was mentioned in the introduction, I, I worked a long time on this gene called period or per, and, and they give you an attaché in, in uh, Sweden, and, and this was our attaché, this delightful man whose name was Per. And so, so the point is, you, we have lived a charmed existence, and uh, you know, it's, it's all been an incredibly fortunate ride, and thank you very much for the attention. Thanks.